Pull up a chair and buckle up. It's the Original Strength Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, today I am talking with the amazing Dr. Phil Maffetone. He is a teacher, researcher, author, speaker, musician, and all things awesome. You are going to love this show. He dives into running to the 180 heart rate formula, to foot health, to music, and how it helps the brain and the body. Buckle up, guys. This is a fascinating interview. Dr. Mavitone, I, I, I love your work with mostly because it resonates with my own thinking about training. Um, like your, your, your heart rate formula, 180 minus your age. I, to me, that is just, I'm not a runner but it's brilliant. <laughs> um, and I Thank found, you. I find application for that far beyond running. Um, now it could be oh, off, sure. but it, I, it just fits so well, um, with, with how I approach movement in my own life. Um, how did you, how did you come up with that? I, I know you've trained thousands of runners, but like what, what made you figure that out or discover that? Well, it was it was a long time ago. Uh, of course, uh, it was in the '70s that I started um, monitoring the the heart rate, and and I realized there was a connection between heart rate and intensity. Of course, which is basic science, um, but also the relationship between intensity and gait. And in a runner, it's easier to see because you can monitor them and you can watch your, their gait at the same time. And, and back then, the running boom was booming and the, uh, the, the, really most of the athletes that I was seeing were runners. Uh, um, I saw some cyclists and you know people doing weight training and, and the triathlon scene was just starting to wake up. And, um, but I had a lot of runners and I would go to the track every week with uh, a, a group of people that I worked with and we'd, um, you know, all run around the track. I'd kind of run back and forth across the infield and watch their gates and take notes. And, um, and it became evident after a while that at a certain level of intensity, as that intensity rises, as the heart rate rises, the gait becomes slightly irregular. <clears throat> so I thought that's interesting. Um, and I also realized uh, even before that, that, that uh, various health factors, uh, injury rates, um, uh, nutrition, uh, mental, emotional states were also associated with gait. Um, much of that's been known for decades, really, especially the mental, emotional parts. And um, so I started kind of putting it all together and found um, that I can determine someone's training, aerobic training heart rate that would best suit their needs because everything was, was all about personalizing. I was into, we need to take care of this individual. I, I never gave uh, uh, diets or workout plans everything was tailored to the individual. And this was a big, a big part of that. And so I, um, I would come up with these heart rates uh, that were best um, <clears throat> to use for submax training. Um, and I was lecturing somewhere about this and somebody said, well, how can we do that without coming to see you? Um, and um, I was a little embarrassed because I didn't have an answer. And I didn't want them coming to see me because I was already overwhelmed by that point uh, now in 1980 or so with, uh, with, with athletes. Um, and so I started thinking, how can I derive this heart rate number in a simple mathematical way? And that's, to make a long story short, that's, that's how I did it. So, 180 was not a meaningful number by itself. It's just a means to uh, get to that end result individual that personalized heart rate. And, um, you know, we could, 
you, you can play with the numbers different ways and come up with a different formula, but the 180 minus the age was uh, somewhat similar to what people were familiar with, which was 220 minus the age, which was a theoretical max uh, heart rate, which it turns out is not even close in most people. Right. And um, uh, so uh, it, it's 180 minus the age, and then you have to modify it based on your personal health data and your personal fitness data. And so um, that's that's how the, the formula was born. And I, I used it to compare with what I was finding on people uh, clinically, and I just found year after year, it, it continued to be quite accurate. And then gradually, as, as I started um, getting people into a laboratory, and then as physiologists and, um, and others started um, measuring people during treadmill tests, they were telling me that this is really, really quite accurate to the lab uh, information. So that was nice to see as well. So for, for 180 minus a person's age for, for a running heart rate, that tends to slow them down from what they're used to or what they want to do. Um, and yeah, you about have 80, about 80% 80 of them have to slow down. Uh, the, if you're a runner, if you've been a runner, um, most of the people are gonna have to slow down. If you're a beginner, you have nothing to relate to, but you're basically sure. going to be sure running slow. Did you did you ever or do you get pushback from runners that want to just go faster and they don't understand why they have to go slow? Or All the why time. They should? It's depressing for some. <laughs> uh, it's an ego check. It's really, you know, it's like saying, "Well, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna get back into weights. I haven't done it since college." And you go into a gym and you think, "Well, I, you know, all you can relate to is what you lifted." 25 years ago. And um, of course, you either get hurt or you physically can't do it and you're embarrassed and you never come back. Um, that's the ego part of, of exercise that people need to get over. Um, but <clears throat> what, what running slow means is that your aerobic system is not really well developed. You're running slower because your aerobic system can't keep up with, with what you would like to do. Um, and so you need to build your aerobic system to develop it so that you could run faster and faster at the same, at that same heart rate, which is what happens. You get faster and faster at the same heart rate. And then in, in a relatively short period of time, it may be six months, it may be a year, <clears throat> at some point you, um, you have to run faster and faster, and then you start complaining that you're running, you have to run too fast. Do I have to run this fast? Gosh, I, I can't run this fast every run, you know. So um, it's it's interesting to see that that progression. I, in, I think it was in your 159 book about the running the marathon below two hours, you were talking about running slow to get faster. And that's that's pretty much how it works right there. Exactly. You, you build your aerobic system up <clears throat> and that submax aerobic state is predictive of anaerobic performance. So the faster you get aerobically, the faster you become with your, your, your racing. And this is true in all sports and, and it's just not easy to to see that happen in sports like basketball and soccer. But um, if you get on a bike, uh, if you're a basketball player and you get on a bike and you measure yourself, you'll see how much faster you have to pedal. And that translates to uh, uh, having more endurance. So by the end of the game, your energy is really high. You're not fatigued as much. And um, and your, your eye-hand coordination, you know, in a golfer, the same thing. How do you measure this in someone who's playing golf? Well, you can't really measure it during golf play other than by the fact that your scores get lower. But, um, you know, as, as the holes go by, as you get, you know, 9, 10, 14, 15, you know, 
um, the 16th hole, uh, you're, you're fatigued a certain amount. And the less fatigued you are, the better you're going to play. And if you look at uh, performance in any athlete, as time goes on, fatigue sets in and they slow down. And that's true aerobically and anaerobically, of course. Um, it, it, you know, we know about it with, with lifting a weight. We obviously fatigue, um, which is a very important thing I suspect we're going to be talking about here. But everything, you know, from a performance standpoint is um, fatigue based. Uh, and that includes mental performance as well. So, so basically through, through honoring the principle of starting where their body's at really to, to build their cardiovascular, your, their aerobic system up, they, they become efficient. Um, and in being efficient for their sport, they don't tire. So they're able to make better decisions. They can focus better. So that's also where the, the performance factor really improves, like, especially for the golfer, right? So he's not going into fight or flight mode because he's not freaking out or his body's not stressed. So he can stay cool hand Luke longer. Exactly. Exactly. And, and it's a, it's a good point because you, you know, you could do more with the same effort is, is what's going on. That's and, awesome. um, you know, so we generate ATP to get energy for muscle and all other work in the body. And um, that ATP comes from, <clears throat> excuse me, fat and sugar. And the fat burning component of it comes from the aerobic system. This is along that line. This is fascinating to me. You had, uh, you talked about in, in the 159 book that if a person runs slow, it improves their gait and helps get rid of muscle imbalances. Yeah, it's actually a, a therapeutic aspect, one of the many therapeutic aspects of aerobic exercise. Can you can you kind of explain in a little bit, um, if it's possible, how how that happens? Sure, there's a number of ways, but one uh, important one, in addition to you know improving circulation. Uh, in, in improving the immune system, improving um, uh, free radical, reducing free radical production. One of the important things about aerobic muscle fibers, the slow twitch red aerobic muscle fibers, is that they control, uh, they support the body. They support our joints. They support the bones, the soft tissues, they support other uh, muscle fibers, namely the anaerobic fibers. So, um, because the anaerobic fibers don't have long-term energy, they have short-term energy, they're burst fibers, power fibers. Everything else we use is a long-term energy system that is what the aerobic muscle fibers do. And so the aerobic fibers they support us all day long. We, we walk around in our office, we, we, we go for a workout, we go and sit down and, and have, you know, have a meal. Uh, even all night long, we need support. Our body physically needs support. And it's the aerobic muscle fibers that have long-term energy available because they burn fat. Um, those control muscles and in doing so, they also uh, help um, balance along with this whole thing of circulation and all those other benefits I mentioned. Um, and the result is that muscles function better. The, really, it's the brain. The brain functions better. And so the brain's ability to send messages down to the muscle fibers is improved and we, um, we have better neuromuscular function. Yeah, so um, I have a, a company called Original Strength, and what we, we try to help people remember how they're designed to move. The premise being that the better the information the brain gets, the better the outformation that goes down to the body. Like, Man, so, that's, and, and, so, that's so true. It's just, uh, and, and I know I like your site. I, I, know, I know what you're doing, and you're doing really uh, a great service for people. And that education, you're right, it's just, it's vital. And and for, for one reason in particular is that we're bombarded by so much garbage 
from from the media, from uh, the hype of of companies selling products uh, that come and go from exercise equipment manufacturers. You know, this is the latest, greatest machine. Everybody needs it. Well, you buy it, and then three months later, you're selling it in your garage sale with a, <laughs> maybe a few others. Uh, and people buy it, and then they do the same thing, and then they sell it in somebody. You know, it's a big, vicious cycle. No, and that's that's what I think I really resonate with you is is because you're the movement heals approach, the right amount of movement um, heals approach. And it doesn't have to hurt. It doesn't have to be the no pain, no gain. Um, it's just, I get, it's the sensible approach, really the natural approach. It's very natural. Uh, we're made to move humans. Uh, the earliest humans uh, relied on movement um, along with diet, um, a healthy diet, because there were no healthy food, unhealthy foods back then. <laughs> Um, you know, and, and so uh, movement is, is, is really key. I don't, I mean, this is, I think maybe the first time I've sat down this morning, um, uh, you know, not moving is a problem. Sitting is a particular problem because humans are not meant to sit for very long. What, um, you, you have a recent book uh, about Get Strong, called Get Strong. And you have an approach called, and I love it, it's called slow weights. Yeah, and I, man, I have tried to, to call it something better for years and I couldn't come up with anything. And, and so I just kept calling it slow weights. Uh, it's not that you're doing the, the workout slow, it's that you're taking your time over the course of a day and a week and a month to slowly um, do, do the workouts and it doesn't, uh, it, the, 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 the process of getting stronger is not a slow process because the very first workout you do, you begin to get measurably, with an EMG machine, measurably stronger. And so um, uh, I, I, always, I always want to warn people about the slow. People don't like doing slow things. <laughs> the, the, you know? the word scares them. <laughs> yes. But yes, slow... Um, Slow weights is sort of a, a component of my Get Strong program, uh, which which is what I do, um, and uh, it's it's uh, it's different, uh, but it's really it's really quite effective. Well, it's that to me that is the the back in our ancestors' approach to to movement throughout today. Um, it's almost like just going to the well every now and then to get replenished, even though we're talking about weight training. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's the word natural again applies because uh, humans have, have developed to, to have natural strength, which we get by moving. And most of our movement is slow and easy and not, you know, we don't sprint from point to point uh, when we do have to sprint that mechanism can turn on at a moment's notice and we don't even have to train for it. You know, you, you, you go out and, and, and look, look to see what happens when it starts raining in a city. You see all these out of shape people sprint for cover. Um, they didn't train to do that. We have a, a, an autonomic nervous system that can click on our, no, uh, our, our sympathetics and you know, get those anaerobic fibers sprinting. We can only do it for a few seconds, but um, the aerobic system, we, we, need, to, we need to train that. Um, and since we don't do that naturally anymore, uh, most of us, uh, some of us do, but most of us don't. And so we need to do what's called exercise. And uh, that's, what, that's what aerobic exercise is. I, uh, so given what you just said about naturally and how we don't need to train sprinting and stuff, I, I, and I kind of know your stance on this, but could you tell me your thoughts about fle uh, flexibility training or stretching? Could you tell me your thoughts about stretching? <laughs> sure. I, I recommend against stretching uh, because most people don't need it. Um, and as soon as you say most people, uh, you know, half your audience is saying, oh, well, I need it. You know, it's like saying, um, you know, we need to think about our, the food we eat 
and you know humans would intuitively instinctively know what to eat because their body required it and people say oh well i know i'm you know i need a bagel uh i i have a craving for sugar i i must need it no uh you don't need sugar um and so it, it's the flexibility thing that is is also confusing with people uh, most people don't need the kind of flexibility that stretching will give them if you do ballet if you're a gymnast high dive athlete um you you might need to stretch you may not i know some great athletes who are in that category those categories who don't need to stretch um uh However, we do need flexibility, but they're two different things. Um, stretching can be harmful and the science is gradually catching up with what us clinicians have always talked about, uh, those who are aware of uh, the fact that if you stretch a muscle, it actually gets longer and when a muscle gets longer, it gets weaker. Um, uh, flexibility is what we want and flexibility can be obtained from a good aerobic workout and and especially from an aerobic warm-up so if you're going to do a workout whatever it is weights or uh, interval training on the track uh, you're still going to do a, a warm-up you want to warm your body and warming means you circulate the blood and you can only do that with an active warm-up not stretching so what you do is you walk slow or if you're a really good runner, you jog at a slower pace. And, um, and in doing so, in, in 12 minutes, uh, 12 to 15 minutes, you can, you can improve your flexibility significantly. In fact, you could feel it if you think about what you're doing. Uh, you'll feel your, your body is looser, you're moving easily, the little aches and pains, especially in the morning uh, when you first get up, those little, you know, aches and pains you have or those little uh, tight areas that you might have, um, uh, they, they disappear in, in that active warm-up. And that's because we become more flexible. The aerobic muscles begin to work at a better uh, contraction, relaxation, uh, along with the anaerobic muscles, those that are working at that level. And, and we become more flexible. And as you become more flexible, you can get into your workout, whatever that is, uh, a lot more effectively and without the risk of injury. You've written the most, I guess, digestible information about the, the foot and the elastic energy in the foot um, for propelling the body um, that I've come across. How, how important is the health of the foot for the, the health of the body and the efficiency of the gait pattern, which is, I guess, the health of the body? Yeah, uh, good question. And I've, I've uh, I mean, I've studied the human body since, uh, well, since high school, really, but, but certainly in college, you know, detailed um, investigations into body performance. And then, you know, later on in professional school, doing human dissection. And, you know, you look at this thing and you just, you know, all the amazing things that we see in the body and, and really everything is amazing, but there's some really phenomenal things going on. Uh, one of the most amazing, one of the most unbelievable things is this mechanism in the foot where we take gravitate, we take energy, gravitational energy, and we convert it into kinetic energy. That's science fiction. Um, <laughs> But it's real. It actually happens. And uh, but in order to do that, we need to have a good uh, a good gait. We need to have a muscle balance. We need to have um, our our um, our ligaments, our tendons have to be uh, working well, which means we have to have muscle balance. And so it's a it's a big cycle. And um, uh, one of the things that interferes with that can be shoes, many shoes, many kinds of shoes, dress shoes, uh, sports shoes. Uh, and today, um, 
in particular since, I would say since the late 70s, by 1980, they were starting to make sports shoes thicker and thicker. And of course we already had um, high heels uh, for women. Of course, then men started wearing them uh, with their, their, their boots, with the big, you know, high hey. heels. And, um, and it was pretty well established by then that these things were unhealthy for us. They were unhealthy for the spine. They were unhealthy for the knees. People with knee problems would often have uh, pain in their knee because of improper footwear. And so um, seeing the, the, the problem with this energy, return energy system in the, in the, in the feet, and the Achilles tendon plays a big role in that, which is why there's so many Achilles tendon injuries. Um, the first thing you want to look at is, is uh, the shoes. And the flatter the shoe, the less attempt by the shoe to hold you up, support you. You know, everybody thinks you need arch supports and heel supports. And, you know, that's a, a lot of gimmicky stuff um, by shoe company manufacturers. Um, there are times in, in someone who's disabled in someone with severe foot impairment, when you need to intervene with something, uh, taping, uh, um, arch supports, uh, special shoes, uh, and in almost all of those people, you can progress to the point where you can get rid of those things and have them function, have them walk naturally. Um, on their own because you've reestablished muscle function. You know, our arches are just muscles. And so um, uh, we, we come back to that good muscle balance to, to allow our, um, our gait, to allow our foot to hit the ground and take that energy, a lot of that energy, and return it into kinetic energy. Um, and it's, a, it, it's just a very important thing. And then when we look at the foot, uh, we need to look at wear and tear. Are there a lot of calluses? Do we get black toenails? You know, meaning the shoes are too too small, which is a very common problem. Mm -hmm. um, and in and in some people, you know, in a diabetic, for example, we have circulatory problems that affect the feet significantly. Um, so we we need to look at the foot as well. But we we start with the shoes get rid of the shoes that are not good, or even if we're in doubt, get rid of them. Make sure you have a, a shoe that fits. Uh, the shoe numbers that people are familiar with have no, uh, n there's no logic to those. Those are industry, those are company numbers. So one shoe company that makes a size 12 and another shoe company that makes a size 12 are typically two different sizes. And so if, if you think, oh, yeah, I wear a size eight, I'm going to go buy a, a size, yeah, give me those in size eight. No, try them on. Try them on and walk on a hard surface. And, and, and they should feel perfect. And since you don't, don't have anything to relate to, try on the next size, the next half size bigger and see if they feel as good or even better. And often they do. And then try in another size, half size, bigger. And if that's too big, usually people know when it's too big. And you go back a half size, and that's usually the best, the best size for you, regardless of the number. What is a, what are your methods for someone that wants to restore the health of their feet? How how can they do that naturally? They can take their shoes off and walk. Really, as simple as that. That's what humans have been doing from the beginning, walking barefoot. The barefoot walking gets your muscles contracting that wouldn't normally contract as much or as well when you have shoes on. And if you could walk in sand, that's better. If you could walk, you know, just walk around the house barefoot. We shouldn't bring our shoes into the house anyway, but walk, you know, when you, when you get home, take your shoes off and walk around the house and uh, do it as a therapy, walk outside around your grounds, assuming you don't use um, 
pesticides and uh, and there's other things out there you don't want to step in, but just, you know, walk uh, wherever you can walk safely and comfortably. And it might take you a while. I, I know people who um, uh, can't physically stand barefoot because they're so used to being in a shoe that holds them up. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, you know, that means they need to start with just standing for a few minutes and they gradually can take a few steps and it starts to feel okay. And then gradually they can go for a walk and it feels okay. And then when you need to put shoes on, if they're good shoes, they're not gonna hurt you as much because you've rehabbed your feet because they need rehabbing if you've been stuck in shoes all your life. That's awesome. And the answer is so simple, it's perfect. Also, you are a musician, yes? I am. Thank you for bringing that up. <laughs> well, you, you seem to be like the guy that just kind of loves doing a lot of cool stuff. Um, like you, you work with elite athletes, but you're in, you train yourself, but you also develop your own skills and you have a passion for music. How, how I do and, 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 and other things as well. But I, I you know, I, I woke up um, uh, in 2003 and realized I was a songwriter. Again, this is what humans have always been doing. Humans have been singing to each other long before language developed. In fact, music is what helped language get developed. Um, music, human music has some really, really important biological functions and, and we've been doing it forever. And, um, and I realized that Gee, I, I've been listening to music my whole life. I listen to it every day. I love it. I was obsessive with it, you know, earlier in my life. And gee, why don't I write my own music? Because that's what humans did. They had their own music. That's how people distinguished one another. That's how people were attracted or not to one another. That's how people protected their families and so on and so forth. And so I became a songwriter. I literally quit my career for a little while. And uh, I, I've come back to it. I've come back to it, uh, uh, or I came back to it a few years later because I was seeing the relationship between music and the body, music and the brain in particular, and therefore the brain affects the body. And, um, and that was a, an amazing uh, awakening for me uh, to see what I sort of intuitively knew, but to see the brain waves as a result of listening to some certain kinds of music, the music that you love, uh, and how that affects the brain waves and how those brain waves affect muscle balance and imbalance um, was so exciting. I just, I just said, oh, I gotta get back into this health and fitness stuff again. And I did, and here we are. Can you? Can you dive into that just a little bit, how music helps the overall health of the person, the body, the brain, the nervous system, or even how creating songs like songwriting, that's got to also be good for the nervous system as well. It is. And, and it's, and, and music as a, as a, as a, um, as a, an important part of us has many components. Songwriting is one, uh, playing is one, singing is one. Uh, dancing is one. Tap, just tapping your foot to a song is quite therapeutic. And I, I've written articles about this. It's on my music website. But um, uh, when we listen to music, and we, we have a problem in our society today, music has been relegated to the background. It's elevator music. Hardly anybody listens to music anymore, yet almost everybody ha has uh, some kind of subscription or, or uses the online, the 60 some odd online streaming services. Um, and, um, but a lot of it is, you know, they're listening while they're working or they're uh, you know, the, the music is in the background while they're in the kitchen making a meal or uh, whatever. Um, 
it's a soothing thing to have that music in the background. That's why stores, everywhere you go, every retail place you go, even to a farmer's market, there's music in the background. People, you know, they kind of like it, even though they may not know what the music is and they can't really hear it well, but it's there. And so um, even that has an effect, a positive effect on people. They buy more stuff. That's one of the effects from a marketing, advertising standpoint. Interesting. Um, and and but what happens when we listen to music? Really listen to music when we sit down and we put on some headphones and we listen, or earbuds really work well, um, or we have some 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 good speakers. Um, we we go into this alpha state. It's a state of consciousness where we make alpha waves. These are the waves that are made when we meditate, when we pray, when we're deep breathing. Just closing our eyes puts us into alpha more. Listening to music puts us in alpha. Listening to the music we love puts us in alpha. You want to go into alpha? Listen to a song that you first fell in love with. Close your eyes and you will go into alpha and that song will pass in what you think is uh, you know, 50 seconds when it's actually a four minute song, um, you will be in another state of consciousness. That alpha state is very therapeutic, very, very therapeutic. And again, it can help. Uh, and, and there's some really good studies on, on alpha waves um, helping uh, muscle function, helping reduce um, stress hormones, cortisol, I think is the, the, the hormone they have studied mostly, uh, controlling blood sugar. Um, and so there's some very powerful physiological effects and mental emotional effects are, are quite obvious. And um, I have something called the five minute power break where um, I recommend people lie down, which puts you into alpha a little bit close their eyes, which puts you into alpha. You wear some listening device, um, earbuds or headphones, and you, uh, you deep breathe, which puts you into alpha. And you put on a song that is really a good song or a song you love, um, which is usually one and the same. But if you listen to, um, you know, some of the great songs, uh, um, the one I recommend is one of mine called Rosemary, which is actually the first one I played for someone when I was a musician while doing an EEG, uh, helping someone do an EEG. And, and, and I saw these amazing results and I said, wow, my song is doing this. And I looked into it and I, you know, discovered that certain songs like uh, Paul McCartney's Yesterday, um, and, you know, people, people always say, well, what song should I listen to? Um, it's the songs that you really like. So if you don't like the Beatles, don't listen to the Beatles. If you <laughs> only like classical music, listen to, listen to Mozart because he's got more alpha waves coming out, um, than, than a lot of others, but listen to, listen to the songs you love. Think back at the music you really, really enjoyed when you were, you know, at that age, 17, 18, 19 years of age. Um, uh, but also at the same time, the brain loves to listen to those songs, but the brain also loves to listen to new things. The brain loves um, a surprise. And if you've never heard Rosemary, the song Rosemary, it's a surprise for your brain and your alpha waves will go crazy. I wrote it down. I'm going to hear for the first time Rosemary. Great. So you have, is it true that you worked with Johnny Cash? I did. Was that to help him become a better runner or was that to help him play the guitar better? What? what? Oh. <laughs> That's awesome. Both. I don't, I don't, you know, I'm a holistic guy. I don't, I, I don't piecemeal stuff. I don't, I'm not a specialist. I, I don't say, okay, Johnny, you're, you're unable to play the guitar and I'm going to, 
uh, work with you and rehab you so that you can play the guitar. No, I want him walking on the treadmill, riding a bike, which he ended up doing. I want him uh, 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 seeing, which he was unable to do because he was cortically blind. And, and I want him playing because he physically couldn't play. And so, yeah, I, I worked with him like I would anybody else uh, to, perf to improve human performance. That is awesome. Dr. Maffetone, do you currently, are you taking new clients now? Do you currently work with people? I, I don't. Um, um, I, you know, I, I, I occasionally do, and you might hear somebody say, well, I, I was working with Dr. Maffetone for a little while. Uh, you know, it's, it's sometimes it's a passing thing. Um, if uh, a musician uh, needs some help, I might um, uh, be attracted to that because you know, I do teach creative writing in music. I do, uh, I do lecture. Uh, I have a, my, my most popular lecture these days is music and the brain, where I talk about how music affects the brain and how we can improve our brain because we can keep improving our brain until we die, yes. unlike the human body. And so, um, that's what I what I talk about, and I I also help people play music because our educational system has gotten so bad. We want to make it so complicated. Um, it, music is so easy. If you can count to four, I have a three minute lesson I give people. In three minutes, I teach them on the piano to learn. I I teach them every major and minor scale and every major and minor chord. In three minutes, they never forget it. The prerequisite is they have to be able to count to four and most of them can. And so, um, you know, we, 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 even people who have taken years of lessons, uh, they say, well, I don't know what to do. I've taken all these lessons, you know, what should I do? Just play. Uh, I was in, I think, Texas somewhere and, um, I was talking about this problem that educators, uh, people, people teaching music and the complexities they make, trying to teach kids music. They told me I couldn't learn music because I wasn't good in English and math. <clears throat> and so I never learned music when I was in, in school. Um, and they're still doing that. They're still making it way more difficult Music is not about A, B, C, or sharps and flats, or diminished, or any of that kind of nonsense. Uh, music is about numbers, that's all. If you can show, that's how I teach that three minute lesson, because you can count uh, and learn all of that, all the, the music you need to learn. Um, and I was, I was talking about that, <clears throat> and I said something like, you know, people take music lessons for years, memorizing all these scales. Um, and there's some woman in the front row that said, yeah, that's me. I said, oh, well, can you come up and play a song with me? Because when I do music in the brain, I also play some of my songs that kind of is related to the areas of the brain I, I'm talking about. And she said, oh, I can't, I, if you have the music, I said, no, no, you just come up and play. I'll play the guitar, you play the piano. <clears throat> she said, oh, I can't do that. I said, well, can you play a B scale? Oh, I'd have to think about it. Come on up here. So I gave her the three minute lesson and she's kind of saying, wow, this is like, I, I don't even have notes. I said, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna play a song. Uh, you, when you're ready, just start playing with me. And she said, well, what, what do I do? Just play, use your brain. And I started playing and and I eventually heard a note, one note. Oh, then I heard two. And then she started using two hands. And then by the end, she had this great outro solo that was like, and we finished and everybody was applauding. And I said, thank you. That's how simple it is. And, and I looked over at her and there were tears rolling down her cheeks. And she said, I always wanted to do that. You know, after years of taking lessons, she, she was prohibited from having fun. What a, what a shameful thing that we do to students, whether they're adults or kids. 
Um, so that's, you know, I still get those kinds of rewarding things, um, which are just really important. They are. Well, I think they help your balloon fly. You know what I mean? Like that's yeah. what keeps you afloat. Yeah. Yeah. And it, and it feels so good to see somebody discover something, whether it's that they can move without hurting or they can play the piano all of a sudden without needing notes. <laughs> yeah. Or that they can even move. You yes. know, I, I've worked a lot with brain injured kids who couldn't move. And, you you know, you see these things and they're, they're and, and people say, oh, it's a miracle. It's it's you call it a miracle. Sure. Uh, we are miracles. The human body is a miracle. And if, if your child hasn't moved her, her legs in seven years of, of life um, and suddenly she can move them now, that's basic physiology. That's called biofeedback that we use to get the brain and the muscles contracting. So um, it's, it's a lot of fun. Yes, it is. This is That's actually where the, the, the concept of slow weights and the concepts of um, manual biofeedback, I kind of developed around the same time. They kind of built on each other. When we do biofeedback, say with a stroke patient who can't move you know, a limb, well, it's not that the nerve is severed. It's right. not that the motor cortex is non-functional because he can move his left arm. Uh, it's that the motor cortex can't find the fibers because some of those pathways are damaged from a stroke. But there's other ones. The brain is plastic and so are the muscles. Hey, what an amazing thing. Let's get the brain to find other fibers by having the muscle contract or try to contract. And within a minute or so, it does contract. And it's a miracle. <laughs> And, and so I thought, well, uh, we could do the same thing with weightlifting. We could lift a weight and make sure we get more muscles, uh, make sure we get more muscle fibers contracting, but without fatigue. And, and in someone like an Olympic lifter, that's obviously important for people, for an endurance athlete who doesn't want to add, you know, 10 pounds. Uh, that's really, really important um, uh, to someone who doesn't want to go to a gym and look at themselves in the mirror. Uh, they want to get strong because they're weak. God, we have such, I mean, the weak, the prevalence of weakness in the population is astounding. What a serious epidemic. And it's, it's interesting though, because it's, is multifactorial because some of them they they believe they're weak um and that they they can't do physically do things or do do the things that they think they want to do and then yet and inside their body they have enough strength to pick up a car if they need well, that's to. that sympathetic response and, right and and that's you know um uh that's like the guy running out of the rainstorm sprinting sure you could do that so on paper, it's there, the mechanism's there. Right. Uh, but you, we don't want to stimulate your sympathetic system that much every day. We don't really want to do that at all. But um, if we need to, we could and we will. And um, But the fact is that we can enlist more muscle fibers than a muscle. And that's how these, you know, these skinny uh, people can, can lift more weight than a big bulky guy and, and yeah, so uh, we, it's kind of like you're just trying to turn the muscle on, not make it bigger. You're just trying to give it full access. Yeah, yeah. I mean, sometimes you have to make it bigger because you play professional football. But for most people, um, you just need strength. And if aging uh, causes muscle loss, that may not be so bad. You're actually more economical. But if aging causes uh, weakness, it's a big problem. Right. You're awesome. If somebody, <laughs> I'm seriously, um, if somebody wants to, to learn more about running or about getting strong or, or in your books, do you have a place for a place where they can go? And if they want to learn more about your music and how to, how to learn about music and how music helps the brain, is there 
a place they can go? Sure. My music website is maffetonemusic.com. And I've got um, not just my own music, but I have uh, articles, music articles, and um, I don't know what else, other cute things, photographs, and uh, a, an article about my work with Johnny Cash, uh, which is also a chapter in the book that uh, Robert Hilburn wrote a couple of years ago called Johnny Cash. Um, and all the health and fitness stuff is under philmaffetone.com. And there's probably 400 articles um, on the topics we talked about earlier. If you're listening, guys, I will put those in the comments in the notes section of the shows. Um, Dr. Maffetone, this has been Amazing. Thank you so much for sharing your time. Thank you, Tim. Way. I appreciate all the, that you're doing. All right, guys. Thanks so much for listening to the Original Strength Podcast. Thanks for listening, everyone. Have a great weekend.